Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Restless Remarkable Books 52. We have a lot of amazing books to talk about today. The first book is Shiloh's Season by Phyllis Reynolds Naylor, 1996. This is an outstanding children's book. It's the second in the Shiloh trilogy. It's a novel set in West Virginia about a boy and his dog, an angry, violent, alcoholic man, family life, simple living, rural area, not much money, tragedy, and forgiveness. Yeah, so these same characters, there's this boy with his dog, and then the neighbor, who was this real bad guy who was, in a, who was abusing his, actually had been his original dog. He had, like, hunting dogs that he abused, and the book had run, the dog had run away, and this boy had, uh, you know, had become attached to the dog. So anyway, this is more of the same, and it, I found it very appealing because of the, because of the, you know, the natural environment and, um, you know, the simple life, which I find very, very, very attractive. And so it's another, another wonderful book about a boy and his dog and life, the different things that happen in life. The next book is The Heavenly World Series and Other Stories by Frank O'Rourke, 1946 to 1955. Oh, so these are, this is a pretty old book. I actually bought it and read it primarily for the title because I'm a big baseball fan. And, you know, the World Series is practically a, almost like a heavenly thought for, for the average baseball fan, especially if they haven't been to the World Series and... Uh, this, this book is a, a book of baseball fiction from the old days and has a good values and a good guy. And, uh, uh, and like I said, I've even had dreams about the World Series because Cleveland, my team, has made it in my lifetime. And now, uh, let's see, I think four times. Lost all four. <laughs> 1995, 1997, and oh, just three times. And then 2016. Yeah, that's right. Three times. We lost all three. So anyway, uh, and I, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, the, the, as I said, the title is very, very appealing, the Heavenly World Series, if you're a baseball fan. The next book is Spider Sparrow by Dick King Smith, 1998. This is a beautiful story. It's a children's book. It's about a quote-unquote special boy, I think he, he may have been autistic, in rural England during the Second World War. And the boy could talk with any animal. Now, he was, had his problems with, with people, but he could talk with any animals, including birds, dogs, horses, otters, fox, lambs, and cows. They called him the crow starver. Well, I'm not sure what that is, but this is really interesting. A really interesting book because uh, it, this, fellow, this boy who had this tremendous ability to communicate with animals and to apparently understand what they were saying, the sounds that they make, the different sounds that they make, and he could respond and communicate with them. Fascinating, wonderful book. The next book is The Zach Files, Through the Medicine Cabinet, and Great Grandpa's in the Litter Box by Dan Greenberg, 1996. This is a really tremendous children's book. It's about a parallel universe. It has places like, instead of New York, there's Newer York. And the great-grandfather reincarnated as a cat. Very funny, interesting, silly, creative. It's amazing the creativity that people come up with, the things they come up with through creativity and imagination. So this is very, very entertaining. And the uh, guy did a good job. Dan Greenberg, wonderful book. The next book is The Crossing by Howard Fast, 1971. This is a tremendous history book. The Heroism of George Washington in December 1776. The American Revolution had started in uh, 1775 in Boston. Boston was liberated, but then uh, New York fell. The, the fighting, in, it was, there was fighting between the U.S. Army and the British in the late summer of 1776. Not long after the Declaration of Independence, it was a total disaster. The, the British won very big, and the American forces had to retreat. In fact, the American Army was was dissolving, and most of the people thought the war was over. The war, war had been lost, and the, the American army retreated from New York City across New Jersey and crossed the uh, Delaware River into Pennsylvania, So, um, and it looked like, looked like everything. The war was lost, and then Washington knew. General George Washington knew he had to do something. Something had to happen to turn things around. So 
uh, he recrossed the Delaware River, and there's a famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. Actually, he recrossed it because they'd already crossed over from New Jersey to Pennsylvania on December 26, 1776, and, uh, and they attacked uh, Trenton, New Jersey, which was manned by uh, mer German mercenaries working for the uh, British Army. They called them Hessians because of the German state of Hesse. They had a very brutal reputation. And this was a, this was a, a great victory. And the poor fellows who, who, who were involved in this, uh, in this action, they, they marched all night. You know, they crossed the uh, Delaware, which was freezing, at chunks of ice. Made it, some of them didn't make it because parts of the river had frozen. They were exhausted, hungry, covered in mud. You know, a lot of them had fallen down. It was slippery. It was around freezing temperature. They're, they had long hair, barefoot, some of them you know, wearing rags. When they arrived in uh, Trenton, these guys were out of their minds with pain and fatigue and, and hunger. And so they started screaming when they entered Trenton. And these German, the, the British troops who were Germans, uh, these guys were really startled. And uh, they thought they were demons from hell. And there was, there was a little bit of fighting, but it, it was over pretty quick. And, the, and the, these uh, hated, terrifying soldiers from, from Germany were, were defeated. And the U.S. acquired a lot of weapons. That was very important because there was a lack of weapons and uh, really, tr really turned things around. It really helped morale tr for the American cause. And I think there was more than a thousand prisoners taken, British prisoners, these German mercenaries. Wonderful. So this, this is why that famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware is so important because it was a, a critical moment in American history. And because of George Washington and the hero heroic men who, whom he led in, in uh, in December 1775 at the amazing, wonderful battle, victory at Trenton, New Jersey. The next book is Help! I'm Trapped in Obedience School by Todd Strasser, 1995. This is a very funny children's book. It's about a, a boy and a dog that they change bodies. In other words, the boy goes into the body of the dog and vice versa with hilarious results. Yeah, very, again, Really a wonderful imagination because this boy, you know, all of a sudden he's in his dog. Maybe he was complaining, you know, that the dog had it better than he did. So, yeah, he gets to experience life as a dog. You know, he's, that's what he's doing. And uh, he, he learns, I, th I think he learns to appreciate being a human being and uh, what a more and more uh, and more understanding of what his dog, what dogs go through, the life of a dog. Very interesting. The next book is Why Time Begins on Opening Day by Thomas Boswell, 1981. So this is a this is a baseball book. The author talks about guys like Whitey Herzog, manager Billy Martin, Earl Weaver, Jim Palmer, and uh, the old days, nostalgia. Yeah, it's interesting because in baseball, opening day is this. Uh, if you're if you're a baseball fan, it's this really big deal, and I know that usually the the stadiums sell out even if it's pretty cold and. Uh, Kind of a magical day, the beginning of spring, especially if you live in a cold area like here in the Cleveland, Ohio area. You know, baseball is the is, is, is comes along with spring and the end of winter. You know, and the, so it's people are very very happy because it's a miracle, the miracle of spring after the long cold dark winter, and then opening day. Yeah, it's 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 a magical day at the beginning of the baseball season, and you're the team you're rooting for. You're hoping that they can win. Win the World Series, not just win the pennant. People had the, I used to have the wrong dream in the old days. I would say, the Indians are going to win the pennant. Well, that's not enough. You, that only gets you to the World Series. you got to win the whole thing. So opening day is a magical day, wonderful day in, for, in the calendar year for a baseball fan. The next book is Rebel and Saint by Lance Webb, 1992. Wow, this is an amazing book. It's the story of On Onesimus. The first, a first century Christian in Greek Turkey. You know, now, you know, Greece was much bigger than it is now, you know, and back then, you know, what's now Turkey was uh, controlled by Greeks and uh, an area where there was a strong growth in, of, in, in, of, among Christians, early Christianity. Anyway, he was this guy, Onesimus, was born a Roman slave. So this is during the Roman Empire. He was friends. He was a friend of the Virgin Mary. Wow, interesting. He met uh, you know, Jesus' mother and the Apostle Paul. He rebe 
Actually, he re- rebelled against God after a horrible earthquake killed many of his loved ones. But later, he regained his faith. He served as a bishop in the early Christian church and was executed by the Romans at age 77 in the year 110 A.D. for refusing to worship the emperor Trajan and curse Christ. He was dragged by a chariot till his death. Wow, courage, love, heroism, and the early, good history, early Christianity, one of the early Christians. Yeah, so the thing is, actually, the emperor Trajan was a pretty good guy, but, uh, you know, they were, they were persecuting Christians early on, and the, this was a threat to the Roman Empire, these Christians, especially when they, you know, they were very peaceful, and the, the Romans were worried that, oh, wow, how are we going to defend our empire if everyone becomes so peaceful? So they, they, that's why one of the reasons they persecuted Christians. And later, of course, Christianity developed the idea like, yes, we should be peaceful, but there is a righteous war, and we, you, know, you should defend your country. So then it became permissible to fight in war for Christians. But early on, they actually thought, no, no, we can never be Christians. We can never be soldiers because war is always wrong. Anyway, this is a wonderful, very inspiring book of an early, one of the early saints in Christianity. Tremendous. The next book is The Story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting and, 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 uh, in 1920. Oh, this is an old book. Uh, it's the story of a doctor in England who somehow learns how to speak with animals, so he becomes a veterinarian. And with a house full of animals. Of course, you've probably, they've, they've made movies about this. Dr. Doolittle. And in his home, he had a dog, an owl, a duck, and an alligator. Later, he, went, he goes to Africa to help sick monkeys. Yeah, this, I believe, I'm pretty sure this is fiction. But it's a very endearing character, Dr. Doolittle. The guy who could uh, talk with, speak with animals and uh, really love them. Very, very endearing. The next book is The Theory of War by Joan Brady, 1993. This is an amazing book. It's uh, actually, uh, I believe it's a family history. Well, the author, she researched her family history, wrote a very entertaining book and historical book about her, uh, her grandfather, whom was a white slave after the American Civil War. You know, the U.S. Civil War produced, was, in the United States really wasn't a very rich country back then. It was early in the Industrial Revolution. And then the war itself was so destructive and disastrous. There was so much economic hard times because of the, because of the war. And uh, anyway, this, her, her, her grandfather, he was, I think, a boy after the war ended, and he was sold into slavery. He became a slave. And uh, for, well, not for his entire life, but for, for a number of years. And I know at one point, one of the most troubling parts of the book is a, a guy decided to uh, get his teeth you know, because back then, uh, well, teeth for dentures, he thought. So he came up to this kid, and, and, and he just he just pounded it, pounded his face and dislodged this boy's teeth. So the boy lost his teeth at a young age. And the guy took his teeth so he could make money selling them as dentures. Wow. He was a son of a Union guy who fought in the war from the, from the North. Very hard times. Very tragic childhood affecting his children and grandchildren. Family history. So, yeah, this shows, yeah, the, what, you know, it's good to try to understand our parents and grandparents to have a better understanding of our own lives and uh, what people have gone through because uh, then you can maybe be less judgmental and more understanding based on, especially, you know, people are, some people are very disturbed and, you know, and, and you can be very frustrated with them, especially if it's your parents, grandparents, or whatever. And so this, this just shows how, what happens, how trauma can be transferred from generation to generation. Very interesting book. The next book is Rifles for Wati by Harold Keith, 1957. This is an amazing book. It's set in the, um, in the American Civil War uh, from 1861 to 1865. Uh, this character, Jeff Bussey, is a Kansas farm boy who joins the Union Army and fights in Oklahoma. He becomes a spy among Ch- the Cherokee Indian Confederate Army. Fascinating. Didn't know much about it. Didn't know that. So the, apparently the Cherokees fought for the South in the war. And uh, he stayed with them for 14 months. You know, he was, he was a spy. He fell in love with a rebel Cherokee girl named Lucy Washburn. 
At that time, Oklahoma uh, was, well, it was, it was called the Indian Territory. The Indians who had been taken from the east were resettled in Oklahoma. Well, late, and later, actually, they were kicked out of Oklahoma. Yeah, so they had to move even farther west. But it was the, uh, not only the Cher Cherokees were one of the, of the Indian nations who were living in, in Oklahoma at that time, among others, they were forced by President Andrew Jackson to move there from Georgia. Uh, this character, Jeff, becomes good friends with his, uh, con actually becomes friends with these people, the Cherokee Confederate soldiers. Uh, so the Cherokees were part of the Confederacy. And so this was a wonderful history book, and it sort of inspired me to want to learn more about the, about the Civil War. And uh, God bless Abraham Lincoln and the Grand Army of the Republic. That was the Union Army. Actually, out in this, not, not far from us in Rocky River, Lake Road, part, a section of Lake Road is called the Grand uh, Army of the Republic Highway to pay respects to those fellows who fought the Civil War to end slavery and keep the United States one country, especially Ulysses S. Grant, who was actually my great-great-grandfather, Tom Zook, was at the Battle of Vicksburg. He was in the Union Army with, with General Grant, who later became uh, President of the United States. And we should, uh, yeah, we should honor and, and, and pay respects to all the guys who fought in the war, including the Confederate soldiers. Uh, because, uh, and from what I understand, the Civil War, spiritually, was the purpose was to keep America one so we could play a major role in world history, a positive role, and to burn the bad karma of uh, all the suffering that had been inflicted on American Indians and African African American slaves. Very interesting topic. Wonderful book. Good history. The next book is The Slave Dancer by Paula Fox, 1973. Wow, another amazing book. Uh, this is a this character, Jesse Bollier, is 13 years old and is kidnapped in uh, New Orleans in 1840 because he, he can play the fife. Yeah. He becomes a sailor on a ship. I guess he was kidnapped to entertain the sailors on this ship. And uh, they sail to the Bight of Benin in West Africa by, so, and buy African slaves with rum and tobacco. So it was a slave ship. Wow. Then they sail to Cuba to sell the slaves um, and in exchange for molasses, which they would bring to the United States. However, a typhoon strikes all die except for Jesse and an African boy, and they're shipwrecked in Mississippi. And uh, they're helped by an escaped slave, and then he walks home. So he finally makes it home after this long adventure, this ordeal. As an adult, he moved to Rhode Island, fought in the Union Army during the Civil War. He endured unspeakable evil, but survived and became a good man. Wow, what an amazing story. Yeah, this is, this is a thing that's wonderful. People say, oh, these bad, you know, they blame things that happened to them for becoming, well, for degenerating. Say, oh, I'm like this because of these bad. Look at this guy. You know, he had uh, horrific experiences. And, you know, he was, but it, it didn't destroy him. He didn't become an evil guy, a bad guy, a mean guy. He became a good guy, a good man, a kind man. And he helped end slavery by joining the Union Army and fighting in the Civil War to defeat the Confederacy and uh, end slavery. So, wonderful, wonderful book. Incredible. The next book is Banished Children of Eve by Peter Quinn, 1994. Wow, yeah, this is, this is why I'm making these videos. There are so many incredible books that have been written, and this is one more. This is a historical book. Uh, yes, this is history. It's set in New York City in 1863. And... Uh, and the North and Abraham Lincoln, the President of the United States, he has the weapons. He has the guns to win the Civil War, you know, the cannons and the, uh, the rifles and so forth. But he needs men. You know, it was a bloody, very bloody war, and, you know, so many guys were dying. So they had a draft. A draft is when they forced guys to join the army. It's very controversial. And so, anyway, when the draft is begun, New York's long suffering Irish immigrants haunted by starvation, poverty, and humiliation in Ireland by the British, and semi-slavery in America, rebel. And the worst riot in American history happens. So these guys were rebelling against this uh, draft of being forced in the American army. They didn't want to do it. You know, they'd, they'd been through so much, and they were tough, tough guys. Said, no, we're not going to join. You can't just tell us we're going to 
They were in the U.S. Army. I, they thought, I thought this was a land of freedom. What's this? So they refused to, quote, as they said, quote, fight a war to free the niggers so they can take our jobs. Yeah, so they thought, they thought to the, they, they were saying, you know, that, oh, if the, if the African Americans become free, they'll come north and take their jobs. So they thought they, they didn't want to help end slavery. So this, in this riot, they, it was pretty bad. They attacked uh, rich people. You know, they were poor. They attacked, you know, some of the rich homes. They ransacked some of the homes. They, they, they attacked free blacks in New York City, whom they identified as, the, as their enemy. The thing is, they weren't. So this kind of was pretty sad, what the, their, their reaction. And one Irishman, who was smart and wise, he gave this speech to these, to these fellows during the riot. He's trying to stop the riot, and he said, Boys, you've got it half right. It's down with niggerdom, not down with niggers. And when he says niggerdom, you know, he's talking about slavery, basically. That uh, He said, you know, you can hate slavery, but don't hate the slaves. I mean, don't hate free blacks. You know, we're all... We're all, you know, at the bottom of the, of the social order. And, uh, and uh, anyway, and he says, Down with the system that makes one man a serf and the other man a slave, then sets them at each other's throat. Down with them who put us here to kill one another over who will sw- sweep the floor. Anyway, this crowd didn't go for it. This is kind of, you could say he was a communist rebel, you know, actually before communism. Of course, this... The French Revolution had happened, so people were inspired by that. This crowd, they didn't go for this speech. They hooted and booed and called him a nigger lover. Anyway, wow. Samuel Zuck is mentioned. He was a New York City, he was a Union general, general killed at Gettysburg. I wonder if he was a distant relative because my grandmother's maiden name was Zuck. Beautiful book. New York City during the Civil War. Wow. Amazing history. And it really gets into the nitty gritty. And, uh, yeah, what these, uh, you know, what Abraham Lincoln had to do to try to win this war, to keep America one and end slavery. And then these, and then these fellows who, they didn't want to join. They were, they were fed up with everything. You know, they said, no, we're not going to war we're, because this is like an infringement on their freedom. And they'd already been through so much. So they were, they were willing to fight, and they did. Of course, the, the riot was defeated and uh, because, you know, the U.S., uh, and eventually, these guys, yeah, they were. Well, I can't remember what actually happened next. Whether the, but they, uh, whether they were, how they were able to get soldiers to fight this war and to win the war. Fascinating. The next book is Iron Scouts of the Confederacy by Lee McGiffin, 1993. It's another wonderful history book. It's also set during the Civil War. Two country boys from Alabama, uh, they go to war. They scout for the Confederate Army. Uh, the Confederacy, lo- of course, lost the war, right? And then there's this quote, I don't aim to take this war home with me, Gant. There will be some who will plant bitter seed. They won't be able to forget or forgive. Wade Hampton lost his brother, his fortune, his son, and the war against the Union. I thought this was, I, I love this quote because, you know, the, it was very tough on the, on the guys from the Confederacy. So many had died. The South was devastated, and it was very tragic because the slaves got their freedom at the same time that this uh, disaster happened to the South. So it didn't help relations between whites and blacks in the South. But I love this character saying that he was, uh, you know, he wasn't going to be bitter. Okay, we we lost the war, we suffered, and uh, but uh, and ultimately, I think if you're a Southerner in, in the, I would imagine in the coming years and decades. They, would, they said, well, it's actually good that we lost because it's, it's good that the United States is one country and that what's now the Southeast is a part of the United States. And I'm sure most people today would agree, yes, slavery had to end. So, and I love this idea that you know, he didn't want to be bitter, okay? Not going to be bitter. I'm not going to, I want to, we lost the war. Okay, now we got to go on with our lives. We got to live our lives. And there's no point in living a miserable life and angry and, and destructive life just because of the trauma of war. So this is a wonderful lesson for any situation we go through in life to, uh, to let go of it, whatever it is, because we, it's not going to help us if we, if we are haunted by the past. We need to be positive. We need to forgive and let go of stuff and move forward, see what we can do today. Wonderful, amazing book. The next book is Noli Me Tanhare by Jose Rizal, 1887. Wow. 
You know, this this book is is read in Philippine. I think it's required reading in all high schools in the Philippines. And uh, I'm not sure how much the kids enjoy it because they're forced to read it. Too bad. Too bad. And uh, and maybe their you know their reading comprehension isn't. This is a kind of a challenging book to read. And uh, I read it. You know, here as I mentioned here, I was well. I think I was 50 years old when I read it. So my I didn't. I'd been doing a lot of reading. Anyway, I really really enjoyed it. I read a translation by Leon Maria Guerrero, and I really, really loved it. It's such an amazing story. And the, the thing that, that did bother me is it's way too sad, very, very sad story. This character, Sisa, very, very tragic woman. And then Maria Clara, also very tragic. Uh, the guy I liked was Pelasipo Tasio, who is like, I guess, Pelasipo mean a philosopher. And this another character, Elias, very, very tragic. Uh, Tar- Tarsilo, the rebel, is very inspiring. He was tortured to death, uh, yet he never, he never would give the information that this character, Ibarra, who is like the hero, was involved in the revolt. And so as I re- when I finished this book, I had my opinions, and I wish I could have talked to Jose Rizal. And I, I thought, oh, Maria Clara should have gone abroad with, with Ibarra. And she, I guess they were, they were in love with each other. And Ibarra and Maria Clara, and, and she joined a convent, and I guess she wasn't strong enough to, but they were in love, and her family was against her marrying him. And the, this is a, an exp, uh, actually a, an expression in the Philippines. If a woman is a, Mar, they call it a Maria Clara, she's like a goody-goody, very, very good, and so forth. And, uh, but the real, uh, so I, anyway, if I could talk to Jose Rizal, I said, oh, you should have had, this is too tragic. And then Sisa. I believe her two, uh, she, she, her two boys uh, were taken from her. And then she found ba- Basilio. Eventually, she was reunited with her. She actually went crazy, went crazy. Her sons, I can't remember the circumstances, but her son, she lost her two sons. And then she was reunited with them, and then she died shortly after that. I thought, oh, my gosh. How, is, how could Jose Rizal write this, something so tragic? And then and Palazzo Potasio his thoughts seem like my own. When I read his, every time it, it has him thinking, and he was, uh, as I said, as the more he read a lot of books, he was really loved reading books. And according to the book, the the more books he read, the poorer he became. You know, it actually takes some money to be reading books all the time, and uh, you're not making money when you do so. But but uh, theoretically, that's why I'm hoping these 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 videos, these YouTube videos, become popular because. Uh, because uh, my, my sister said, oh, all Peter does is read books all day. And uh, so hopefully, which is kind of true. But anyway, I thought I really could relate to the thinking of Palazzo Votage, a guy who's really thinking. He's not just, you know, knocked down, beaten down, and subdued. He's really trying to fit, understand life. He reads a lot of books. So I thought this was a tremendous, amazing book. And it's too bad. You know, back during the Spanish time, if this was a considered a, uh, this was illegal. If you had... A copy of the Noli Me Tanere in your home in the Philippines, you could be arrested by the Spanish. So they were, when they were reading it, they were very, you know, furtive. If those, a lot of people were afraid to read it. Oh, they didn't want to get in trouble. And those who did, it was, it was very, it was, it was an cur- act of courage just to read this book back in the late 1800s. And it inspired Filipinos to believe in, in themselves that they were good people and fight for independence against the Spanish. And my, my wife, uh, and actually the, uh, they, uh, yeah, in fact, if you had this book in your home, you could be excommunicated. And my, I asked my wife once, I said, well, she's a good Catholic. I said, what would you have done during that time? You know, if, if would you have read this book and, and risked excommunication? She said uh, she, would have read, she would have read it because, you know, she was, she's a good Catholic, but not in favor of all the things, the bad things the Spanish did in the Philippines. So, boy, I, I really, really love this book. And uh, it's, it's kind of ironic because... Uh, now, when the kids have to, they have to, by law, they have to read it in a school in the Philippines. And uh, so, uh, and I, I think, you know, that a lot of them are like, oh my God, it's, it's an ordeal. They, they don't enjoy it, which is too bad. And I think they're probably too young because it's, this is tough, pretty tough, tough writing. Jose Rizal was a very smart guy. And this book is, is not easy reading. So you have to have pretty good reading comprehension to, to enjoy it. And I really did. Of course, I read it because I wanted to. Amazing book. The next book is Philippine Fright by Marivy Sullivan Blanco, 1996. Well, this is uh, some of the scary things, beliefs in the Philippines, like the Arbu Arbuliario Aswang 
Balete, Ghoul, Giant, Capre, Manang, Manananga, Nuno, Sapuso, Tianak, Tik, Balang, and so forth. Scary, scary stories, part of Philippine culture. Very interesting. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you find a good book to read. I really, I really appreciate you watching this video. Take care. I'll see you next time.